have a lot of spiritual things that the Lord has been doing. We have prophetic things happening. And we have physical things in the natural that are confirming what's going on in the spiritual. And uh, I wanted to go into those. Uh, we've had some major things happening in the nation of Israel. And it looks like this is Israel's year to just explode. This is their 70th year. And so we are we're involved in that, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I heard that in May, on the day of the 70th anniversary, the U.S. will open its embassy in Jerusalem. Okay. Glenn is trying to steal my thunder here. Oh. <laughs> you were drinking water. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's let's start. We're going to start out with we're going to start out with this. Uh, uh, here's uh, here's from uh, the uh, biblical archaeology review. King Hezekiah in the Bible, the royal seal of Hezekiah comes to life. So on February uh, 21st, 2018. Uh, this comes out, uh, for the first time, the royal seal, seal of King Hezekiah in the Bible was found in an archaeological excavation. The stamped clay seal, also known as a beulah, was discovered in the Ophel excavations led by Dr. Uh, Eliot Mazar at the foot of the southern wall of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The discovery was announced in a press release by the Hebrew University of Jerusalem's Institute of Archaeology, under whose, whose auspices excavations were conducted. The Beulah, which measures just over a, a centimeter in diameter, bears a seal impression depicting a two-winged sun disk flanked by ink symbols and containing a Hebrew inscription that reads, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. The Beulah was discovered along with 33 other stamped Beulah, uh, Beulah uh, during wet sifting of dirt from a refuse dump located next to a 10th century BC royal building in the Ophel. So the Ophel, if you don't know where it is, it's on the southern end of what is currently called the Temple Mount. Uh, I actually believe that the, that the temple is south of where the Temple Mount is. But basically, let's take a look at it. Um, and when was this? It's from a date. Yeah, I read the date. On the 21st. Here's what, here, here's, here's, here's what it is. Um, uh, this is uh, this is from uh, Biblical Archaeology Review on the 21st of this month. Here's a copy of the seal. It's belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, which we find in the Bible. So this is the first one that's been found. Of, uh, uh, we know that others have been found. This is in uh, it's in the public arena. Uh, others have been found, but are in private collections in the past. There's at least two or three. This is what it looks like. Now, this is what I wanted to show you. Uh, this is this is the sun disk, which is a pagan symbol from Egypt. And it has these little rays coming out of it. And it has two wings, just like Egyptian. And then it has the Egyptian ankh on one side and another one over here on this side. And down here at the bottom and up on top is where it gives this, this stuff. So we see that Egypt, uh, Egyptian, uh, you know, uh, Theology, religion, uh, you know, culture still had a great impact in uh, Israel at that particular time. Still had great impact in, in that uh, that area. And so we have, uh, but uh, we know what uh, what Hezekiah did. Because according to Second Chronicles uh, 29 to 30, Hezekiah began his reform in the first year of his reign, motivated by the belief that the ancient religion was not being practiced uh, scrupulously, he ordered that the temple of Yahweh be repaired and cleansed of nida, which is, or impurity, after celebrating a truly national Passover for the first time since the reign of Solomon, Second Chronicles 30:26. Hezekiah's officials went into the countryside and dismantled the local shrines or high places, uh, the the bamat, along with their altars, standing stones. And the Massaboth and sacred poles, the Asherim, which are erected of penises. The account of uh, Hezekiah's reforms activity, activities in 2 Kings 18 is much briefer. 
And so uh, basically what happened is we have a, a, a leader, which is a king, and he comes to power and he finds a book of the law and he reads it and he says, man, we're doing everything wrong. We've got to change. And, uh, and so he sets out and they not only uh, rededicate the temple they, and they re-cleanse re the priesthood and they reenact the law and they begin a, a Passover uh, and, I, and is this the one where they did two Passovers, two eight-day festivals, one, one behind another? Uh, and they actually doubled up on it, I think. Uh, and so basically, um, we have a situation here where drastic change comes. And I would uh, say that you should think of uh, Hezekiah and Donald Trump as being similar. This is Trump's first year. This is Hezekiah's first year. This is what this is what he did. And uh, uh, I won't go into, there's all kinds of stuff. You can go to uh, Biblical Archaeology Review and you can find that um, that article. Just, just a quick question. Tom. Yes. Did they say what the material construction was for that Hezekiah seal? Well, that is uh, uh, what it's made out of. Uh, that is clay. The, 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 the part, it's not the seal itself. It is the result of the seal. Um, it's pushed okay, into the wet, ah, wet clay. Okay. This seal that causes uh, cause, it causes it. It's like the signet ring is the thing that does the actual thing. But these are these are things. So uh, what we want need to see next is then the day following. This this was found and uh, on two twenty two. This was found. This is the seal of Isaiah. This is the seal of Isaiah, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll go over here. And we'll take a look at this. And this is this is a part of a seal. It's broken off, and they think they have they can they can fill in the rest of these letters over here that are they're missing. It has three letters, uh, Hebrew characters that are that are missing. And uh, what we find is this. Uh, we find uh, the next day they announce. That the Isaiah Beulah is, uh, uh, has been found. Uh, it's uh, divided into three registers. The remains of a grazing doe in the top register, written in Hebrew. The name uh, Isaiah appears in the middle register, and the letters N V Y are vis visible in the lower register. The drawing shows several reconstructed letters in blue. The Hebrew letters Vav and He. At the damaged end of the middle of the middle register, and the letter Aleph at the damaged end of the lower register. If these if these letters were added, then the seal impression would read, read belonging to Isaiah the prophet. So this would say belonging to Isaiah the prophet. Uh, and we found this. This is the first time any evidence, literal evidence, has been found of Isaiah. And so we find this happening on 2.22, evidence of uh, Isaiah the prophet. And it's found, where is it found? It's found in the Ophel, uh, which is right adjacent to where I believe the temple was originally built. And it's the area of, uh, of uh, uh, King Solomon and David's uh, uh, fortress there. And so what we have is we have major things beginning to happen, and we have these physical things happening on literal days. And then we get this, uh, this uh, word from uh, uh, John and Jolene Hamill, and they just sent it out, and uh, it's titled this, 2-22, Seals of Prophet Isaiah and King Hezekiah Recovered, turnaround verdict now in play and we're going to talk about the turnaround verdict what that is now it's in in play uh and this the, he says you can't make this stuff up for real a few days ago an anonymous source tipped me off to watch for news on 222 because an archaeological find of massive importance was going to be announced we both felt it was a sign of the turnaround and a new season promised to the body of Christ. And today, on 2.22, the Times of Israel, an astonishing discovery has been announced. 
The seal of the, of the man who prophesied Isaiah 22, 22 has been found in an archaeological dig near the southern steps in the Temple Mount. And so what we have is, a, 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 it is in a find of biblical proportions, Prophet Isaiah's seal claimed to be unearthed, proclaimed the Times of Israel article this morning, chanced upon a near seal identified with King Hezekiah. A tiny clay piece may be the first ever proof of the prophet. Uh, let us put this, pers- this in perspective. On 222, the seal of the prophet and the seal of the king have been recovered. He says, I am prophesying to you that we have now entered through the doorway of this new season, the next phase of God's work in this nation and in Israel and the nations has begun. The seals of governmental authority granted to his prophets and kings is being recovered now. The turnaround verdict is this, Daniel 7.22. This is predicated upon Daniel 7.22, the turnaround verdict. Judgment in favor of the saints, restraining the enemy and releasing the saints to possess the kingdom. God is executing the verdict he has rendered in favor of the saints. You remember how the Lord moved according to this verdict first in Israel with the election of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, then in America with the glory train uh, turnaround tour and the subsequent election of President Trump. Within a year, relations with Israel were repaired with Trump even honoring Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And Israel's new planned railway will even have a Trump station right at the Temple Mount near the southern steps where the seals of Isaiah and Hezekiah have been recovered. What's Israel doing? Because of what Trump is doing, they have a new train coming right through there. They're going to bring tourists and things to to the Temple Mount site and all of that. They have named that site Trump Station after Donald Trump. He is like a Cyrus. He is opening up that area. Uh, And this covenant with God is the source of all governmental authority that we have. and so we have this, uh, this very similar to Esther's seal and the Purim decree. Uh, Esther experienced a turnaround in her day exactly as prophesied by the verdict of Daniel 7.22, and inclusive of this was the restoration of governmental authority over those set to persecute her people. This is vitally important to understand. The seal of governmental authority was literally recovered to be immediately put to use. Take the rest, the risk, friends. Stand in court's heaven and plead your cause. See how the Lord renders judgment in your favor and executes his judgment on your behalf, even granting you governmental authority that is a seal to write the decree. What happened was uh, 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 Esther, she was given the king's ring and allowed to use that to write any edict she wanted and to seal it and to make it happen. That's what she was given. She was given authority. And then we have this. On 221, Billy Graham passes on. On 222, it is announced that the seals of the king and the prophet are recovered. Serious, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, the, The court of heaven, behold their threatenings. Three weeks ago, I was awakened to the word of the Lord, resounding in my spirit, an amazing message from the word. Acts 4, 29-31. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word, by stretching forth your hand to heal. And the signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Behold their threatenings. The apostles approached court, heaven's court, seeking a verdict of justice from the persecution of their time. Amidst this literal awakening, I saw the Spirit of the Lord was releasing us into the next phase of execution of the Daniel 7.22 verdict in America. Just as God released the progressive execution of his verdict against Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. He is also executing his verdict of justice progressively in our land. And as of 222, we have entered into this next phase, which is even inclusive 
of the deliverance from the deep state and its claims upon the freedoms of our covenant land. Mm -hmm. And we're claiming the deliverance from the deep state right now. Dutch Sheet says they are meeting at Trump Hotel. Where is that? As midpoint between the Department of Justice and the FBI. These are two agencies that have been in criminal action against our president and, uh, and, and uh, they are being exposed and taken care of and that spiritual authority is being released today. It's being released today uh, to take care of those things and we're going to receive deliverance from the deep state. Once we have deliverance uh, in the Department of Justice and the FBI then those agencies are going to go after the other agencies that are corrupted and filled with corruption and pedophilia and embezzlement and every other crazy thing under the world uh, that you can so imagine. Uh, that what we have now is we have a turnaround. Judgment is made in the favor of the Most High. Uh, 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 in favor of the saints by the Most High. Beloved, it is no coincidence that the recovery of Hezekiah's seal and Isaiah's seal was announced today. As with Israel, so with us. I believe God is granting breakthrough of similar magnitude in this season, and covenantal governmental authority is now being restored at a higher level than what we have ever seen. Welcome, friends, to your new season, Turnaround. Covenant blessings to each of you. That's from John and Jolene uh, Hamill, and I appreciate them and their ministry. Uh, just a little bit uh, on this, a little background. Uh, I used to be part of a church, and this church uh, uh, had a college, and these college students every year would go over and work in the city of Jerusalem at the digs over there. Uh, they would uh, they would uh, work around the, uh, the the digs that were going on around the Temple Mount, which were led by Dr. Benjamin Mazar. And uh, one of my uh, uh, friends uh, that uh, I was in, ended up being a co-founder of the Foundation for Biblical Research with was Dr. Ernest L. Martin, and he would lead the uh, youth over there, and he was a historian, and he would uh, supervise their uh, activities at the dig, uh, and he did that for five or six years over there around the Temple Mount, and they found many significant things that were listed in the newspapers at that time. At the same time, he was able to meet with Dr. Mazar and in his home, have dinner with him, talk about uh, archaeology and history and all that. He was a historian. Well, it just so happens that Dr. Mazar's uh, granddaughter is the one that found these. She wow. found them. Elliot Mazar found these. And so we know, uh, uh, we have known uh, Dr. Mazar. He's dead now. Uh, we knew uh, his children, some of his children, uh, not personally, but we knew of them. And we knew we know some of the grandchildren uh, from that from that uh, whole thing. So here she is as an archaeologist, following in her grandfather's uh, footsteps, digging in the same area where her grandfather dug, wow. mm -hmm. and 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 doing all kinds of amazing things. And so we are uh, so we have been following this for 50 years. Oh my you know, following this for 50 years. When we started following the situation, she wasn't even born, you know. So we've been following this for, for 50 years. Now, I want to uh, uh, go through uh, and tell you a story. Uh, the story goes like this. Uh, I don't have it written down anywhere, but I just wanted to, to tell you a story. Uh, I was in uh, our home in uh, Pasadena, California, in, uh, and it was like 2005. And I, uh, I went over to my, my cell phone and I discovered that uh, I had a message waiting on it. And I listened to the message and it turns out that th this was uh, the executive assistant to Rodney Howard Brown. And Rodney Howard Brown was coming to Pasadena and he wanted to meet with me. So, you know, I'm going... Uh, who am I? And I'm a guy that goes to church once in a while, and uh, you know that kind of thing. You know, I mean uh, that's about it. And uh, and uh, he wants to come and have a meeting with me. Well, uh, just so happened that uh, uh, this was actually the fulfillment of a prophetic word to me. Uh, 
I was, uh, I had been uh, just uh, maybe a month earlier at the Father's Heart Conference uh, on uh, uh, William Carey University and uh, some of the people that were involved in uh, in the uh, in leading the Toronto outpouring in uh, 1994 happened to be there. And one guy came by me and he said, uh, he said, I think I've got a word for you. And, uh, and I said, oh, you should be w willing to, t t to accept it. I said, yeah, I'll, I mean, sure, whatever. And, he, and they said, you know, we're from Toronto and all of that. And they said, basically, uh, two guys began prophesying over me and they said, basically we see that that uh, you are really a leader in the body of Christ and you have wonderful anointing and great experiences and all kinds of stuff like that, but you've been passed over and you've been ignored and you've been set aside and nobody's paid any attention to you and you're just kind of out in left field somewhere. And they said, that's all about to change and it's going to change right away and major leaders in the body of Christ are going to seek you out. So they give me this word and then all of a sudden I get a phone call from Rodney Howard Brown's, uh, you know, uh, assistant. And so what it turns out is Rodney was coming to uh, the city of L.A. for the 100th anniversary of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Azusa Street in 1906. So he was going to be there in January of, of, two, of uh, 2006. And he was kind of setting things in place as he was coming. And through a whole series of uh, mistakes... Uh, he got cut out of the, uh, the, the, the big conferences that they had going in the city of L.A. They, the, the, the conference wanted Rodney Howard Brown to come and lead at least one night of revival uh, at the conference. But uh, because of uh, messages were lost or misinterpreted, uh, he ended up holding his own meetings at Mott Auditorium in Pasadena during that time. So they called me up and asked me to come over and spend some time with him. So uh, I, uh, uh, I met uh, his assistant, with, which is Jennifer Gagne, and her husband was a pastor, Eric Gagne, and they have a little son at the time, Elliot. And uh, I would uh, uh, walk around during the day while they were helping set up, and uh, because uh, he was about a year old. And so uh, because she was busy, I would kind of take care of Elliot and walk around and I would be, be with them and all that, and, and we would be there for the, meet, uh, the meeting that evening, and we'd just hang out with them all the time. And then after the meeting, uh, uh, each night, uh, Rodney Howard Brown had a green room, and he would take all of his honored guests, the leading pastors of the city, and all this kind of thing, and he would take them back, and he had a buffet set up, and they would talk, and they would eat, and after the meeting, would, and the meeting would close down. This would be happening like, oh, 10 o'clock at night, you know, kind of thing, because the meeting, evening meetings went on for a while. So we're doing this at night, and so all these pastors and leaders are there, and so he would sit and, and talk to me. And he didn't talk to anybody else. He talked to me, and he held my hand, and we talked, and he prophesied to me. He took his computer out, his Apple computer, and took me through his whole website, and, it, and how he can see everybody that's online, and he showed me all the products and the things that they did. And as we talked, he would constantly go over to his uh, bookshelf there and give me another stack of DVDs. Here's one on the Holy Spirit. Here's one on the New York Revival. And, and I had these boxes of DVDs just kept going going up. Here's the one where the angels sang at church, you know. And he just I just stacked these things up. I had a stack of, of DVDs and stuff. He's just lavishing stuff on me. And he's doing this night after night. Not just one night, does his night after night as I'm there. And so I'm going, what on earth is going on? This is, I'm getting attention uh, like you want it. No, I don't, you know, you don't want that <laughs> much attention, you know. And especially these other guys are in the room want to talk to Rodney and get a word from him and you know, whatever, you know. And he's just, getting, you know, spending the whole time with me. So, um, uh, we were out in the uh, hallway outside the, the prayer room there at Mott, and uh, he's talking to me, and he's, uh, he's saying, uh, you know, uh, Ken, I think we're going to be doing some meetings together. Uh, you know, I might be able to come out here and do three weeks. You know, maybe you could be the host, and we could do, you know, 
and he's doing all that. I'm just a, I'm just a guy, you know, that goes to church, you know, and he's talk, uh, talking to me about, about these kinds of things. And then he shares with me, he says he's, he's, uh, he's got a burden concerning New York City. And he's been to New York City, but he's recently had a vision. And he had a vision, and he's standing on top of one of the major skyscrapers in New York City, and he's looking down at the, uh, uh, the arena there, which is the... The, where they did the fights, uh, Madison, Square, Ma Ma Madison Square, Square Garden. Madi he's looking down on Madison Square Garden. He's standing, and he's standing with Billy Graham, and Billy Graham is teaching him how he led the revival at, at Madison Square Garden in New York City. So Billy Graham's teaching him this in this this exper experience he has, and 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 uh, Rodney knows uh, someday I'm going to go back to New York City. And I've got the, the, the uh, you know, Billy Graham teaching me. So he shares with me, this with me in the hall. And, uh, and, uh, and so I said, well, uh, did you hear about Neville's uh, uh, dream concerning you? He said, Neville who? And I said, Neville Johnson. I, he said, I don't know who Neville Johnson is. I said, well, he's a guy that uh, Jesus meets with face to face on occasion. He meets angels and all kinds of stuff. He's got a word concerning you. And Billy Graham. He says, well, what is the word? I said, well, I, you know, I told him best as I could, but I said, I think I've actually got it. I think I saved an audio file of it uh, somewhere on my computer. I'll send it to you and all of that. So we, we, we sent him the audio file, and essentially what, uh, what happens in this word uh, that uh, Neville delivers, he says, I had a dream. In the dream, uh, I saw that uh, uh, when Dr. Billy Graham dies, that uh, Rodney Howard Brown is going to be given a new uh, gift. It's going to be a gift from heaven of prophetic evangelism. He says it's not been given before. This is a new gift. Prophetic evangelism is going to be given to Rodney Howard Brown at that particular time. So uh, we say, okay, uh, that is incredible. We, and so Rodney, uh, uh, Pastor Rodney and I and others are familiar with that. have been waiting. We've been waiting. When is Dr. Graham going to die? Because that's going to be a sign that something major is going to happen at this particular time. Yes? Does that tie in with Ken uh, Clement's prophecy that when Billy Graham dies, his mantle will fall upon two people, one man and one woman? Okay, uh, I didn't hear that, hear that uh, but Glenn is saying that there, Kim, Kim said it's going to fall upon uh, a mantle upon one, one, one woman and one man. Right. And, uh, and so that, that that very well could be. I, uh, people are saying right now that it's going to fall upon a whole generation. But, uh, you know, and, and so we will, we will take whatever but it happens. But I know what the Lord said concerning this. So what happens is uh, uh, Rodney says, I, I, I need to talk to him. So uh, we, uh, we, uh, we call, um, uh, we try to get a hold of Joe Sweet in Lancaster, and we end up getting his wife, uh, Melinda, and... Uh, we were able eventually uh, to get uh, Neville Johnson's uh, phone number, and uh, and so uh, uh, the uh, Rodney's uh, you know assistant calls Neville Johnson. And Neville Johnson, uh, the phone rings. He is uh, on a train. He is moving from Perth to uh, over to the eastern side of uh, of Australia. The Lord has just told him to relocate his ministry. He's up in the mountains, uh, and he's on the train. They're actually moving right then. He gets a call from Rodney Howard Brown on the, on the train, on his phone. And they talk briefly on the phone. And uh, Rodney says, next week I'm going to be in New Zealand, and the week after that I'm going to be in Australia. Can we get together? So Neville says, yes. So they got together and prayed together and shared at that partic particular time. So that is the Rodney Howard Brown. Now, what do I know? What my I believe that the whole thing is going to happen. I'm going to be involved with Rodney Howard Brown, and we're going to be uh, doing. And my part is going to be to help finance what Rodney Howard Brown is doing. That is what my part is going to be doing. I'm going to be doing that, uh, and and uh, in that area. So then what happens is uh, then we get then, then we get uh, then I, uh, we've shared this several times. This revelation from testing to double portion. 
And uh, this is, I'll just go through it briefly because we've covered it before. On 2-26, 2017, I had a, dr a, dr a dream in the morning before dawn. Val and I were with our son Benjamin, and we were going to be separated for a while from Benjamin. And so Ben wanted to pray for us. And he had a scripture for us. And as he prayed, I saw 2 Corinthians 2.9. So I see this, uh, wherever it is. I see 2 Corinthians 2.9. That's what I see. He's praying this scripture. And I'm listening to his prayer, but I'm seeing this, like hung out in letters in front of me. And as he's praying, he switches scripture. And, uh, well, first of all, this, this scripture says this. For to this end also I write that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. And so essentially what God was saying is, is in this scripture, he's basically saying, you guys are going to be tested. That's what's going to happen. You're going to be tested and, you know, to see if you're going to be faithful. So that's that's part of it. Then what, it, then what I, I see is I see this where the Corinthians is changed to KGS, the abbreviation for Kings. So it becomes 2 Kings 2.9. And 2 Kings 2.9 says, Now it came about when they had crossed over the Jordan, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So I get this. A double portion of the spirit of God be upon me. And it made more sense, more me to be a... This was King. Kings was also my initials. Kenneth Gerald Story. And I'm a junior. So the two meant... So it's like personalized to me, KGS you know, Junior and Kenneth Gerald Story. And so I see that, and then uh, I, as I uh, finish that, the Lord gives the scripture, Isaiah 61, 7, instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. Isaiah 61, 7. So, I get this, uh, which gives us 2 Kings 2, 9. Then Lana uh, Wasser comes out yesterday and says this. Billy Graham's passing releases the double portion of the Elijah anointing. Two years ago, over the span of two months, the Lord took me into encounters and dreams regarding what would be heralded and released on the earth beginning with the passing of Billy Graham. I knew this would be the day to release this prophetic word. I won't be sharing all of the details of the dreams and encounters in this word, but I feel strongly to release the decrees that were, that were released to me in the dream. Two years ago, I had a dream, and the Lord told me that the time was coming soon where Billy Graham would be called home. In this, partic in this particular dream, I, I, I was invited into Billy Graham's house. The atmosphere was full of purity, humility, integrity, character, and strength. The atmosphere of his home testified to the incredible impact of his ministry and an example of what can take place in the world through a yielded life to, to, uh, to Jesus. Uh, at the end of the dream, a prophetic decree was made. And this is the decree. When Billy Graham dies, a double portion of the Elisha anointing will be released upon the earth. This is the declaration. When Billy Graham dies, a double portion of the Elisha anointing will be released upon the earth. Now it came about when they had crossed over that Elisha, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. 2 Kings 2.9 so she is given 2 Kings 2.9 as a declaration to make at the death of Billy Graham. That's what we, that's what we have. Uh, as we see from Scripture, Elisha's ministry was filled with signs, miracles, prophetic warnings, prophetic decrees, and proclamations. Also, this decree was made twice in my dream. So she gets it twice in the dream, 
and represents witness and testimony. As this decree was made, was made, the atmosphere was electric. That is the only way I can describe it. It was electric with the power of the Holy Spirit decreeing the end of an era and the beginning of a new era, the era of the greatest harvest and move of the Spirit up the, uh, upon the earth that we have ever seen. This, is, this will be a significant shift. A time of greater increase of the mantle of evangelism is being released into the, onto the earth. We will see a great harvest, a harvest that will come from every direction. The bountiful harvest, that time is now upon us. A new era, the changing of the guards, a double portion released upon the earth. Much is going to be released by the hand of the Lord from this moment on. We have been in a season of awakening, acceleration, and seeing the Lord move, but the shift has begun now to see the glory of God cover the earth in intangibly increased ways. There will be a significant increase in the eyes to see, vision for what the Lord is doing and releasing upon the earth. There will be a double portion increase of the seer anointing upon the earth, which is 2 Kings 6, 17. And we're going to be seeing and decreeing the ways of God and teaching the body of Christ the ways of God. So if I can see if that is it. And uh, here's another portion. Uh, As I have taken time to sit with the Lord, the Spirit of God has been whispering to me, with the passing of Billy Graham, now shall be seen a great increase in the revival of holiness in my people, an increase in the wave of repentance upon my people, a deep cleansing and a purification to move forward with me into this season of double portion harvest and anointing with greater fruit of humility and character. And so she writes this to Billy at the end. She says, Billy, we love you. We honor you. We thank you for a life well lived, a race well run. You finished strong and well. We celebrate your life. We thank you for the example you were to the world for Jesus and the way you represented him. Your reward is great. You will be greatly missed on this earth, but we we know all of heaven is applauding you, and the Lord has said, well done, good and faithful servant. We have willing hands to accept the torch for a new generation. Thank you for your legacy. And so that was from Lana Bosser, and so, yes. One of Billy Graham's desires was to live to be 100 years old. Yes. He lived 99 years? No. Yes. 100. From the moment of conception was nine months. Yes. And so take 99 yes. when yes. he died, and nine months forward is his 100th birthday. Okay, okay the, that, that Glenn is pointing out that he would have been 100 years uh, old on this earth this right, as he the was uh, begotten in the mother's womb. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a sign for the pro- uh, pro-life for the personhood bill that is before the South Carolina Synod. Yes. That we're praying that that will take over, that mm-hmm. life begins at conception. Yes. Not at birth. Mm-hmm. That's right. But at conception. Life begins at conception. Billy Absolutely. Was a great prophet, a king, and his whole life was lived to the fullest, to the hundred year anniversary <laughs> of his conception. And we just believe that it's also, it is, the putting the desert behind yes. and entering into the warfare and the conquering of the promised land yes. that is coming upon us. We have crossed over. We have crossed over. A new land. There's a new land, a new day. Yes, yes. Uh, this is, yes Valerie. Thank you. I have no. I don't. I don't. I don't have lances. He has said we have just crossed over the Jordan. We have just crossed over the Jordan. Well, okay. So you can. Well, first of all, you can see that uh, the church is getting anointed, and we have. Uh, you know, uh, and just like Hezekiah was anointed, Donald Trump is getting anointed, and on his team with him, and the the Isaiah was the prophet during Hezekiah's day, and they're they're uh, two Bule were found uh, right near one another in the same area where they would have been uh, in, the, in reality, you know. Uh, and so we're really excited about that. Now, 
we have what's called the turnaround conference going on in Washington, D.C. It, it is, and here's a word from Dutch Sheets. It's time for turnaround over our nation. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, so basically uh, he was sent a dream by a trusted prophet. He doesn't say who this person is, but he says this. He says, I dreamed last, last night of the turnaround gathering, which is going on in Washington, D.C. now. In the meeting, there were hundreds of angels with tuning forks in their hands. Reese Howells, uh, 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 Reese, uh, Reese was a Welsh intercessor in the mid-1900s, used greatly by the Holy Spirit to turn the tide of World War II. And John Knox, a great Scottish reformer and intercessor of the 1500s, came in from the cloud of witnesses. Reese held a tuning fork and John a gavel. They presented these to you as they did. You smiled at Cece, which is Duchess' wife, and struck them together. <coughs> so in Washington, D.C., uh, Dutch was uh, uh, going there and he thought, I wonder if I should buy a uh, tuning fork or a uh, gavel. And they said, no, all these prophetic people come in are going to have all kinds of tuning forks and gavels. And, and so they came in and all kinds of people had, had them. And some people gave him a tuning fork and a gavel. And the, what they're doing, and they're going to do this tonight, they are going, they, they start, they've been doing it each day, but tonight in particular, they're going, to, they're going to take the gavel and they're going to strike the tuning forks. People have their tuning forks there. They're going to strike the tuning forks. And this tune is going to release uh, angels into the city of Washington, D.C. and break through. The angels uh, simultaneously struck their tuning forks as he struck his. As the sound began to per permeate in the people, it permeated all the people there, they began to vibrate and spin. While doing so, they morphed into an army of special forces. Illumination came from them and filled the room. Then a man pinned a badge on you that said, U.S. Marshal of the New Sound. And I woke up overwhelmed. So he gets a badge uh, pinned on Dutch. He's the U.S. Marshal of the New Sound. And we have been praying for the U.S. Marshal, Marshal's wife. The U.S. Marshal is the, is the oldest intelligence and, and law enforcement agency in the United States. He was put in place by George Washington <coughs> and the Congress at that time. And they have, they are, one of their uh, jobs is defenders of the Constitution, and they are the people who oversee Department of Justice and uh, FBI and other agencies. They are the ones to do the job. So if we have corrupt people in justice and in, uh, in uh, FBI and in the CIA, then these are the people who are going to clean them up. They have the legal responsibility to defend the Constitution and to, to root out corruption and this kind of thing. And so uh, they, they're gonna need more help because you know, they, don't, they aren't a, a big group, but, uh, but they have the legal uh, authority. Uh, this dream was so filled with revelation is difficult to summarize in a brief manner, but here in a bullet form are some of my interpretations. Hundreds of angels with tuning forks. Angels will be there to assist us in hearing the sound of heaven. Reese Howells and John Knox, We'll be building on, we will be building on and agreeing with the prayers and reforming actions of past generations. Amen. Something I refer to in my book, An Appeal to Heaven as a Synergy of the Ages. Tuning fork. We will hear a pure and clear sound from heaven regarding America. Gavel. The sovereign judge of heaven and earth is going to render his verdict. Hallelujah. As the sound began permeating the people, we will become one with agreement with heaven's words and verdicts. They are morphed into an army of special forces. Just as special forces are hidden, small in number and incredibly efficient, so will we operate. Illumination came from them. We will be filled with and release revelation and glory. And U.S. Marshal of the New Sound, we will function as Christ Ecclesia, the representatives of his kingdom government on earth. As such, we will expose the enemies of God disrupt their plans, enforce heaven's rule, and reform America. So it goes on with many more things. I won't go through it into a whole new era and all of that. But that is the 
essence of it. That is happening on 222. It involves the declaration of Isaiah 2222, where the seals were found on, and discovered on those days, and it, it is a, it, we have walked through the door. Now, what uh, uh, Chuck Pierce has said is that we have a symbol for this year is a uh, Hebrew character, uh, and it looks like something like that. And it's actually made of two characters, but essentially this is a doorway. The character, this is a, this is a, a, a character for number eight. And it has to do with 2018, and it has to do with 5778. It has to do with the eights on the ends. This is, and this is an open door, and the door has opened and the door is open into this sphere on 222 with the death of Billy Graham, with the releasing of all these unctions and anointing, with the double portion Elisha uh, uh, anointing coming upon the church, upon us, upon individuals, new mantles for evangelism being released. And then we get uh, this. U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem to open in May, officials say. <laughs> The U.S. Uh, Embassy in Jerusalem will open in, uh, in May to coincide with the 70th anniversary of Israel declaring its independence, Donald Trump administration officials said Friday. Uh, they, uh, they are getting ready. Uh, we knew that they were going to be having a, uh, 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 you know, a, 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 a major move in 2019. We thought, we thought, this is the eight years we believe Donald Trump is going to serve. We believe that uh, uh, that uh, right here, the, the, before the election in 2018, uh, we were going to have the Dow at 27,000. We're hoping that that's the word from the Lord. But right now, down in here, we're going to have the the uh, the uh, embassy. embassy moved, uh, not moved, but they they have they have a uh, a uh, kind of an office there in Jerusalem already. They're going to convert that office and add several people to it. So it'll be a staff, let's say a staff of 10. But they actually have, in Tel Aviv, they have a staff of 1,000. But they're going to open that up here. Now, what we thought was going to happen, this is year 2019 here. We thought that down here towards the end of 2019, we were, have, we were going to have a full move, removal of the staff of 1,000 people to Jerusalem. And that what, what, what we're experiencing, that'll be a brand new building and all kinds of stuff will be done uh, at that particular time. But basically, we're, we're uh, and so why, why are we mentioning this? Because what uh, the prophets have seen is when the United States actually moves their, their embassy to Jerusalem, that God has decreed blessings upon America for that very action. And one of those blessings is going to be this, that the U.S. dollar is going to strengthen at that particular time. So right now, it looks like the dollar's going down. So watch that. Prophetically, it says that the dollar may go up. Where are we? Okay, we have a few few minutes. Let's... Uh... Is BB going to survive? Yeah. Is BB going to survive? Absolutely. What happens is uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and Donald Trump are fighting the same battles. And they're fighting the same people. The fighting the deep state. This is just the deep state part that's in Israel. Mm -hmm. That's he's fight, they're fighting the same people. You got it right here in South Carolina too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The capital city. Yeah. We do. We, we uh, and and uh, and uh, they are they are they are uh, 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 what they have in Israel is they don't have a law like we have. They don't have a constitution like we have. Here, every agency of government is under the, uh, some, some degree, under the direction of the public. And that is why. Uh, Congress can investigate every agency in the government, uh, and uh, they can take action. And if Congress is not doing what the people want, then the people can replace the Congress and get them to do what they want. What happens is in Israel is they have a civil service and their police and their intelligence agencies are a part of that civil service. And the government has no control over these people at all. They can't fire them, fire them, they can't do anything, they can't, they can't uh, Congress can't call them in front of them, uh, they can't 
Uh, anything that they do is completely voluntarily. The same way of Washington do. Well, uh, they they try to. Well, but this is this is all this is all happening. This is all changing because the the congressional uh, investigative committees are are taking action now, and they're calling forth, and we're getting information, and these things are <laughs> beginning to happen. The uh, let me uh, let me show you this. Uh, the um, Here's this one. I'm going to look at this. Office of the Inspector General. Findings of misconduct by an FBA's FBI special agent in charge for engaging in an inappropriate romantic relationship with a subordinate and misuse of a government vehicle. The Department of Justice uh, Office of the Inspector General initiated an investigation upon receipt of information from, from the Federal Bureau of Investigation that a special agent in charge who is no longer an FBI agent, had provided a substantial amount of personal funds to a subordinate with whom he was engaged in an inappropriate romantic relationship. The OIG found that the former SAC was providing financial assistance with the SAC's own funds to a subordinate when, with whom he was engaged in an inappropriate romantic relationship. FBI policy prohibits a superior from engaging in a romantic relationship with a subordinate. On one occasion, the SAC misused his official government vehicle in connection with the relationship, which also violated FBI policy. The OIG has completed its investigation and provided its report to the FBI. Who's this? Peter Strzok and Lisa Page. Yeah. Peter Strzok is the person who investigated Hillary Clinton, and he's the person who investigated uh, General Flynn, and he's the person who investigated Donald Trump. He has got criminal activity coming against him. It says he's no longer an employee. That man, he's been cut off. He's, he's not making a salary anymore. And we aren't hearing anything from Lisa Page or from him. And so we think they have turned state's evidence. We think that they are, they are talking, and they are talking and explaining what went on. And we believe that Peter Strzok is going to come out and say that my FBI Form 302, which I submitted after talking to General Flynn, was then modified by by McCabe, and and that uh, this is a crime at the highest level, and we're we believe that that's what's happening. So this is the start of it. We're getting the breakthrough, a spiritual breakthrough in Washington D.C. We see this happening right now. We have been declaring for the longest time that we were going to see the breakthrough for Trump and for America in February. And that's exactly what we are seeing. We're seeing an absolute turnaround.